Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're really excited to launch our 2021 webinar series through the Idaho Cultivating Success Program. Today's topic is planning your community supported agriculture production. Cultivating Success has been around since 2000. Our program was established by University of Idaho, the nonprofit organization Rural Roots, and Washington State University. In Idaho, we are really fortunate to be able to offer this Cultivating Success webinar series, and you'll be able to visit cultivatingsuccess.org to find out about more programs that are available in Washington and in Idaho. Just a couple of webinar tips before I turn the program over to Ariel. So if you're having any trouble with your sound or the clarity or speed of connection, you can always call in using the telephone numbers that were provided in your welcome email. If you do that, you wanna make sure that you're muting your computer sound so you're not getting feedback when you're using the phone. Any technical assistance questions that you have, you can type into the chat. You can find the chat in the control bar. For most people, that's going to be at the bottom of your screen. And then at any time during the presentation, you can type questions in for our speaker in the Q&A box. Mackenzie did email uh, handouts to you this morning that were provided by today's presenter. And I'm really delighted to be able to welcome and introduce Ariel Agenbrode. Ariel is an extension educator located in the Treasure Valley in Boise, and she serves about a six county area and has provided statewide leadership with Cultivating Success almost since its inception. She's an amazing grower herself in terms of her garden, and I'm always floored by just how beautiful her plants look and She's done some amazing work in developing tools for CSA planning. So we're really delighted that you could join us, Ariel. I'm Colette De Phelps. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm also an area extension educator in community food systems. I'm located up in Moscow on the Moscow campus. And we also have online Mackenzie Lawrence, who is our program coordinator for Cultivating Success. She's located on the Moscow campus as well and is our excellent technical assistance provider. So please do use the chat if you have any questions on you need any help with any technological issues. And then again, please use the Q&A box for questions for Ariel. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and hand this over to you, Ariel. Welcome and thank you again for being here. Thank you, Colette. And thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Colette is my mentor, colleague and friend. And I'm so glad we get to work together on this. And I didn't realize I was the first webinar of the series this year, kicking it off. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you about one of my favorite things, which is CSA, and one of my other favorite things, which is planning for it. I'm a big planner. Doesn't mean that it always gets implemented exactly how you want it, but um, the planning is really important, especially when we're talking about something like community supported agriculture. So I call this CSA by the numbers, right? Some tools and tips to help you plan your production of your CSA to meet both your market and your financial goals, whatever those might be. So I am gonna be going through quite a few things today in our short hour together. But one of those is just a quick re refresher on um, <clears throat> what you should consider if you think that you are ready to start or to expand or grow your CSA. Uh, we'll talk about some, some ideas for setting your CSA goals, both for profit and yield, how to determine what to grow and how much, and uh, some tools that might help you do that. And we're gonna walk those through. Oops, oh my goodness, what is going on? My computer keyboard, I think, is on its way out. Okay, let me try this again. Go back, okay. Uh, yeah, so decision-making, right? Once you've got this information at hand, how do you go about using that to make decisions for your production? How do you take those numbers and then estimate how much seed or plants you're going to need to meet those goals? And some tips on scheduling your production, your succession plantings, and some record-keeping tools that might help you keep track of all of this and tighten up your production from year to year. 
So a quick refresher, right? What is CSA? What do we mean by this? We're talking about community supported agriculture or some people might call it subscription farming, right? This is selling a piece of your farm to a consumer. Uh, the USDA defines it as a community of individuals pledging to support a farm operation, right? So your, your buyers are um, coming to you, they're, they're buying into your farm, they're going to share in the benefits, but also the risks of this local food production. So this can look like a lot of different, uh, different systems in a CSA, right? We can have weekly CSA, monthly CSAs, produce, fresh flour, meat CSAs, everything. Um, I've seen so many creative uses of the, of the, the system. However, we are going to mostly be talking about CSA in fresh produce today because that's what the tools that I've developed are going to um, be geared toward. So also, is CSA right for you? So perhaps you're on this webinar because you currently are operating a CSA and you just want to tighten it up or dial in on your production. Maybe you're really in the beginning planning phases and then it's really helpful to think about these tools in terms of getting it right. So what else do you need to know about yourself and your operation uh, to know if CSA is a, is a good choice for you? So ideally, right, and there's always going to be exceptions to all these, but ideally you'll have experience in producing high quality, consistent products. Your farm and your reputation are really only going to be as good as the quality you put out. And a CSA is most successful when you have repeat subscribers and people that really buy in and make that commitment year after year. And so they're expecting um, and rewarded by a certain, uh, certain quality product. So your community is interested in CSA, right? You, you've checked into the ability of your community to support your CSA, meaning you've got the, the kind of customers adjacent to you that are going to buy in. Um, there might be other CSAs in your community, but as far as you can tell and in your work interviewing or talking to other growers and buyers, the market is not yet saturated. Um, or there's something unique that you're going to be offering in your CSA that is not being met by someone else. And this is really key, right? I have enough land, water, and labor resources available to start and grow a CSA that's going to meet my income goals. Right, you are going to be eventually limited by how much space you have, um, how much water you have access to, and really how many hours are in the day and, and time that you can spend on this. Uh, so you may be in the point where you're ready to grow it a little bit bigger. So you're looking at bringing in some extra help or um, adding to your land or really thinking about intensive growing to help you meet that, that goal. All right, so if you can answer yes to all or most of these, then come with us, let's go explore it a little bit further. Uh, like I just mentioned, your CSA's size and your profitability is potentially limited by these things, right? Not only the land, the labor and time and the water, but also your community interest, how many other farmers are doing CSA, uh, your production experience, right? How skilled are you at growing um, different types of fresh fruits, vegetables, herbs, et cetera? Uh, your climate, right? How long can your CSA season be without a, an expenditure into season extension or you know, heating a greenhouse? And then transportation, right? If you've got to take your crops to market. Uh, so some of these things can be changed, right? You can maybe develop more community interest. You can certainly hone your own expertise and experience to become better at growing. But some of these you really can't change, right? Your climate, uh, your land labor time and water. We can be creative when how we use those things, but eventually we are gonna run into some limits. So these are the three questions I really want you to think about today and as you sit down and start to plan your CSA. So number one, what are your financial goals, right? Do you want the farm to pay for itself? Do you want to um, cease working off farm if you are? Um, do you just wanna break even or do you wanna profit? And this is really going to determine a lot of decisions that come after this, right? What are your financial goals? Uh, what does it cost your farm to produce a share, right? This is not something you're going to be able to answer immediately. You probably can't even answer it until you've gone through an entire season or a few seasons and averaged out these, um, these questions. Uh, but there are going to be some things that are going to be the same. Your land cost is most likely going to be the same. Um, some of your transportation, some of your energy or water costs might be the same from year to year. So at least starting to try to figure out what it costs you to produce a share. Uh, and that's going to help you to set your price down the way, down the road. And then how many shares can you produce on your farm, right? This is where I hope that these tools are going to help you get a little bit closer to answering this question. 
So some common planning steps, right? As we go through thinking about CSA. Uh, these are just some general planning steps that a lot of growers will go through. Also things that in our research we've come up with. So what is your set, what is your season length for your CSA, right? What is practical and possible for you? So this can be based on your growing season. It can be based on how long you want to be working. It can also have to do with your financial goals, right? So think about what is a reasonable season length. Uh, it could be four weeks. It could be 16 weeks, right? It could be 26 weeks. It all depends on, on what you're able to produce and uh, what your customers are, are ready and willing to buy into. But it's really good to at least get like, okay, this is how many weeks we're gonna produce. Um, setting your share price, right? Again, this goes back to what are your financial goals? What is the share cost you to produce? And how many shares can you fit on your farm? That's really gonna help that price uh, figure out a sweet spot. And a two, it uh, unfortunately is also really dependent on what the market can support, what your buyers are willing to pay for a share price. If your CSA is twice the price of the other um, popular CSAs in your area, people are gonna wonder why, right? And it might be, well, because we're including these other amazing things. It's also a meat CSA or, you know, you're, it's coming directly to your home or whatever. Uh, but you have to think about that market pricing and not overpricing or undercutting your competition. And again, your land, labor, and water are going to determine eventually how many shares you can provide. And we're going to get into these numbers as we go through today. So uh, when I ran a CSA for uh, our campus farm at University of Idaho several years ago, these were the questions that I had, and I really had a hard time finding answers to these. Uh, and that's really what led me to create these tools that I want to share with you today, and hopefully you can find some use in them. Uh, was how do I really figure out what to grow? I mean, I could just grow everything and then hope I have enough. Um, we really had some fixed financial goals for this project. It had to fund itself. It had to fund the students that worked on the farm. Uh, so we wanted to be pretty sure that we were going to be successful. And we also knew that if we didn't deliver on, on our promise to our customers, they probably weren't going to be as eager to support us again, even though it was a, a learning experience. They still were putting their money into our production and they wanted some return on that. Um, so I really wanted to know how much do people eat? Uh, how much do we plant to meet those goals? And how much food we could fit on our farm? So like I said, this was originally developed as part of my graduate work. It has been adapted over the years though, as uh, we've all gotten a little bit better at using Excel and as we've gotten feedback from other growers that have used it. So what I did really was do a lot of research on per capita, what kinds of vegetable consumption was going on, right? So I looked at USDA vegetable consumption data. I looked at some extension publications going back really far up until the present, uh, regional and national publications. And also I talked with a lot of growers who marketed through CSA or at farmer's market about, you know, how much are people really buying per week and eating per week? So these numbers are what went into um, these planning tables. So the next thing I did was I took those, um, those average consumption data numbers for a number of different crops that were pretty commonly grown. And then I looked at what our yield averages would be. Um, so for this, I just went to a bunch of different common sources of information on average yields per acre on a hundred foot row. So looking at seed catalogs, looking at vegetable production manuals, et cetera, to get, okay, in a perfect world, right? What is the average poundage of tomatoes that you're gonna get from a hundred foot row? So I need to really preface all of this with, it's always going to depend, right? It's gonna depend on your production, your climate, your soils, your fertility, et cetera. Um, so these are just averages. They're just a starting point, right? To get us into the planning. Um, and again, a lot of these averages were compiled from commercial operations in fairly stable climates. Uh, they weren't written necessarily for the Eastern Idaho, Northern Idaho, just you know where weather is so unpredictable and your season can be really short. Um, I would say these averages probably hold up fairly consistently in Southern agriculture irrigated climates where we have a long growing season, you know, 160 days sometimes, uh, but it's really always gonna depend. And keep in mind too, that organic yields may be lower. Um, organic growers have gotten really good at growing and they have a lot of tools available to them that they may not have in years past, um, but it can still be lower than the conventional operations, especially if your soil fertility is not everything that it could be. 
So think that maybe organic yields might be up to 30% lower, especially if you're in a transition. All right. Um, and then two, these numbers were adapted after you know a season of using them as a guide. And again, these numbers are going to change every year for you potentially as you figure out and you get better at growing or you change what you grow. All right, so I'm going to introduce the planning tool and then we're going to go into it live and do some calculations and see what we come up with. All right. So this planning workbook, uh, table number one, it's a it's completely customizable and it lets you identify, first of all, how many people do you want to feed? So it's based on a per capita. So if you wanted to do um, 15 individuals, right, you would do this. Um, and typically this would probably be okay for a per person or for a couple share, but if you're doing a family share, you might wanna double or triple these numbers. Again, we'll go in and play with it and look what it look at what it shoots out for us. Um, so what it's basically doing is it's giving us, um, it's giving us estimated amount to plant and estimated yield based on the number of people that we, people that we want to feed, okay? And you, have, you can adjust all the columns and you can also go in and uh, give yourself a security buffer, right? If you have additional market outlets or you just want to be sure that you've got enough. So I'm gonna pull up that table. Okay, and we're gonna get into it a little bit. All right, so here's the basic table. And um, so I'll show you, we'll just zero it out, right? We've got nothing planned. We're not gonna grow anything this year. Uh, I also like to use this one just, you know, if I'm really geeking out on my home garden to decide, you know, how much I'm gonna grow for the two of us in our household, right? So you can see anytime I change this field here, the numbers are gonna change, right? So that's gonna change the numbers. Uh, this number here, this is setting um, just an estimate of 100 row feet, but you can change that as well um, if your row feet are significantly a different size, right? But we'll keep it as 100 for now, and then I'll show you how, we, how that might make sense later. And a buffer, we could do 10%, we could do 30%, or right? if we change that to 30%, it changes our numbers quite a bit. Um, so we'll just go back to just a 10. Oops. You gotta be careful. <laughs> yes, so you, you fill in these green ones, okay? Um, and I will show you, this could change if your rows were 10 feet, it's gonna change it, but we'll keep it at 100, it works best at 100. So it goes through the number of different crops that you might be wanting to grow, arugula, beans, carrots, collards, melons, radicchio, right? Um, you could always add in more columns and more data if there are other things like here, there's a bunch of different empty categories here where you could add in something, but you'd need to know the, um, the average pounds per person and the feet of row and the yield. But you could always get that information from your own uh, growing season records. All right, so let's make this a little bit more realistic for a CSA. And let's say you're gonna start a, a pretty simple, small base CSA just to give it a try because you're already doing farmer's market or you've got a farm stand. So you're gonna try, you're gonna try a 35 member CSA, right? So let's just put in 35 people and see what that looks like. All right, on average, right? And this is the average person. Again, this is gonna change a lot too. Uh, eats a pound of arugula, you know, maybe just a pound of arugula throughout the growing season, right? Again, this is gonna change. You might live in a community where the pounds per person of arugula, they are arugula crazy. They're putting it on pizza, they're putting on sandwiches. You know, they want five pounds of arugula at least during the growing season. So that number you can change here and you can make it higher or lower. This is also really thinking that you're gonna be providing folks with a big diversity over the season and they're not going to get arugula every single week unless they're really, really obsessed with it. Um, this also says five pounds of beets per person, right? Some people are gonna eat zero beets, right? Others are going to just not be able to get enough. So again, this is based on averages, so it's not, it's not you know, perfect, but it's a good place to get started. All right, so this is telling us that um, we need about a third, we need about 30 feet, right? We need about 39 feet of row planted to arugula in order to meet these needs, okay? Yeah, 30, 38.5 feet of row. So this is this will be useful no matter what size your garden is, just to tell you kind of how many feet to plant, right? So let's see if we go down here, let's look at some other ones. We've got, um, 
broccoli, right? Three pounds of broccoli per person. Again, this is not all the broccoli that they're going to eat in their entire lifetime for a year, but it's just a good measurement of about how much they might be expected to eat over the course of a season. So even giving three, you know, three pounds of broccoli, which is not a lot to 35 people is we're going to require about 210 bed feet, right? Or 200 foot rows of broccoli to produce that, that amount. Um, and this is where too, you're going to think about um, your space considerations, right? And what, um, what makes the most sense for you because 200 feet of broccoli for something you harvest once for most varieties is a little bit different than like coming down here to kale, right? Uh, and we know that people probably are eating more kale than this now, especially in salads and smoothies and things like that. Um, but only 77 feet of row, so not quite even 100 feet of row. And if you did plant 100 feet of row, knowing that you can harvest that kale multiple times uh, maybe would make it a smarter choice for your farm. Uh, so some of these other some of these other crops, you know, like to really satisfy everybody's need for pumpkins, might be looking at a lot of space here. Um, again, radishes, depending on how many they eat and how often you're going to harvest it, uh, you might be looking at 100 feet of row just of radishes. So this is a good place to start. And then you can go through this table and be like, oh my gosh, that seems like way too much, right? Or that seems like not even enough, okay? And it might turn out too, as you, as you go further down the season, um, that 100 feet of summer squash um, produces 95 pounds per person. I don't know, just, you know, depends. If you have squash bug problems, maybe not. So that's how you would use this table. And what it's really helping you to do is to visualize um, how much each person is going to receive over the course of the season, right? Over the course of your multiple weeks ASA, um, how many pounds that is total that would be your target goal to produce to meet the needs of those 35 people, right? And how many feet of row will, will satisfy that based on um, standard planting? So there, this table has two sections, right? This first section is really based on um, the, the crops that we determine by feet of row that are typically planted seed-based or planted on feet of row. The second table in this, um, in this workbook is for some of the things that we usually plant via transplants. And so we're thinking of number of plants um, rather than, than feet of row. And this can help you too, especially if you're growing your own seedlings, you can think about it in terms of how many um, and I've got, I'll show you, I've got this is tomatoes, eggplants, sweet peppers, hot peppers, right? So a lot of these crops that we plant, uh, that we start with transplants. So four plants per person, right? And it still goes into what that would look like for feet of row, it'd be about 46 feet of row um, if for four plants per person. Oh, we have to change it to 35 though, right? Right, this is why I wanted to do this live so you can see where, where we can kind of get tripped up. Okay, so 100 feet of eggplant to feed 35 people, four pounds you might have a really terrible season for eggplant and that's not going to work or you might you know live in a really hot dry climate where you grow tons of it um, so potatoes again you'd plant 12 plants or 12 tuber you know uh, seed potatoes per person um, th three hot pepper plants or maybe or three or four sweet pepper plants maybe one or less hot pepper depending on what your clients really like um, so eggplant garlic parsley herbs um, sweet pepper tomato this is just gives you another opportunity to plan this based on number of plants versus feet of row, okay? And so for tomato, this is saying about two and a half tomato plants per person and about uh, actually only 50, 53 feet of row of tomatoes could give us 150 pounds. That's a good tomato year. Ariel, before we move on, I or before we continue on, I just wanted to ask a question that was in the chat. Aaron sure. asked, is row feet based on a 30 inch wide row or is it something different? I'm so glad that you asked this question because I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So hold that thought. Right now, we're just thinking about 100 linear feet. How that looks in your garden and what kinds of rows that is, is going to change depending on your production style, right? But for right now, just think 100 feet and we're gonna configure that differently based on your farm, okay? And hopefully this will make sense. I even have some photos that talk about this later, okay? So that's a great question. All right, I'm gonna stop this one. Oops, it did away, it did away with the PowerPoint, I think. We're gonna get back into it. Okay, 
Right, so this first one, right, that was based on the row feet. The second one was based on the number of plants, but it still gives you an estimated row feet and some estimated yield. So this would be really important, I think, going forward is if you put if you fill this table out to come back and compare that that number here at the end with your yields for the season. And that's really going to help you to change that. And you can go in and customize these tables to reflect your likely yield and also what your customers came back and said that they wanted to eat or didn't want to eat. All right, here we go. Directly answering Aaron's question, right? Planning your bed feet. So the table is going to suggest an estimated feet of row or number of hundred foot rows. So this can be linear, single rows, right? We just got a hundred feet down. We uh, skip 24 inches. We go another hundred feet, or it can be adapted for raised beds or wide row plantings that have multiple rows. Okay. So to um, to kind of illustrate, here this would maybe be what it looked like if you just had hundred foot rows you know, of a single of a single crop, right? There you go, there's your lettuce, uh, there's your, mm, I'm gonna say red cabbage, right? And then your, your marigolds interplanting, that's lovely. Okay, so you could go a hundred feet. Now, if you're planting on a wide bed, right? A wide row planting, or you have raised beds, um, let's say that you have raised beds that are 10 feet long, right? That's how long you've built them. Um, you could put, and you needed, let's see, you needed 100 feet of row um, and you had 10 foot beds, right? You could, how many, how many rows can you fit in that bed, right? And still have the proper spacing uh, for that crop. So here an example, this is a, I think a 36 inch bed and they've got um, planted on a grid about one, two, three, four, five feet of onions in that bed, right? So if that bed is 10 feet long and they've got five rows, they've got 50 bed feet or 50 row feet of onions in this, um, this 36 by 10 foot bed. And I, I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, it's really just in, you're gonna have to convert those linear feet to your bed feet based on how many rows across you can fit or how your spacing would fit across in that system. Ariel, we have another question that came in and I think you're gonna get on it right now. Okay. And it's asking about whether or not in the planning you're looking at single plantings or multiple successions. Wonderful. Oh, you guys are just so brilliant. You're just guiding me right along here. All right. So, yeah, I mean, thinking about most of your customers are going to want to eat something more than once, right? So you're not looking to harvest all of your cabbage at once and give everybody six cabbages that week. Uh, because unless they're making uh, sauerkraut, um, mostly people get a CSA because they just want to have fresh ingredients that they can use and make meals all week, unless you really have like a, a preservation CSA, which is a whole nother thing, right? But nobody really wants six cabbages in one week. They want a cabbage this week, and then they probably take two weeks to get through that cabbage. And then maybe in another three weeks, they might want another cabbage, right? Unless they're really cabbage crazy. So a few ways to plan for that is think, okay, I know overall I've got this much cabbage that I need to plant for everyone. How am I gonna do that? So here's a few ways to do it. Number one, you can plant, and, and maybe you just love this one variety of cabbage. It's the only one that you and your, your customers like. So you're gonna plant that one repeatedly. You're gonna you know, do a small planting of that cabbage every couple of weeks. Um, and that way you're going to have repeated successive harvests. However, um, you might want to also think about um, planting cultivars that have differing maturation rates. So this is one way that we did it in our CSA is we chose about four or five different cultivars of things like onions. Uh, we chose three different cultivars of broccoli that had really diverse maturation rates. So everything from, uh, oh, and we did this with green beans too, because you can do a lot of successions with green beans but you can find green beans that mature anywhere from 46 to like 65 days, right? So that's quite a bit of variance. So you can choose a number of cultivars that have varying maturation rate and just do it that way, knowing that when that crop is done, the next one will start to come on and be ready to harvest, et cetera. So that's another way to plan your successions. Um, another way might be just to do a single planting of say, you know, a crop that can be grown in spring and fall to grow it at the beginning of your season and then midsummer plant another one to have as a fall harvest. So you could do this with 
any of your greens with a number of your root crops, right? Just so they're not overloaded with beets at the end of the season, they might get early season. Um, the other thing too that you can do is you can overplant and you can give them baby vegetables at first and then move into the more mature version. So you could do this with carrots. Um, you could do this with a lot of your greens, right? You get a first cutting of lettuce and then later on you're gonna get the whole heads. So lots of different ways that you can plan to have successive harvests um, you know, and make it easy on yourself. So I hope that that kind of answers that question. And really listen to your customers, you know, often get feedback from them on, are they getting enough of something? Do they want more of it? Do they want it less frequently, more frequently? Um, pretty much they're often gonna say, um, we get tired of greens by June and we want the tomatoes, um, or they might just actually be not getting enough of some of the things that they really know how to use. Okay, so our next, yeah, okay, so the next table that I wanted to share with you is, um, this is just an example of how you could schedule your production, right? Um, and again, this is gonna be really a personal choice. I'm gonna open that table just so you can see how it works. This is gonna be a personal choice as to how you do this. You might just do this on a notebook. You might use an app for this. Um, you may just have a number of little pieces of paper that you keep together. You might do this on a giant whiteboard or chalkboard and keep track of this and then photograph it for later. Um, but however you do it, we really can't emphasize enough how important it is to keep some records and to plan out your production so that you're not stuck um, making decisions on the fly, right, and trying to catch up or to find supplies or to, you know, get something done. Um, also so that you can go back and evaluate what worked and what didn't and make the changes because you've got a record of when you did something. So I'll just go through my thinking for why these are included and then you can think about if this is something you want to use or not. And again, this is um, really comprehensive, right? Start with all the things and then narrow it down to what you actually need. So we, we start here all the way with arugula all the way through um, to, to tomatoes. And again, you can add anything you want in here. It's all customizable. So it's a good idea to keep track of your cultivars, right? And that's why I've got arugula, arugula, basil, 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 right? If you had multiple cultivars. Um, so this might be rocket and this might be something else. Um, and this is a good way for you to keep track of which cultivars performed well for you, which cultivars actually um, harvested when you thought they were going to, right? So your succession interval, this might be where you say, we're gonna plant first on you know, uh, February 8th in the hoop house, and then we're gonna plant in March in the garden, right? These are just totally random examples. So plan your successions. If you're gonna be transplanting, you know, so maybe we come down to cabbages or broccoli and you're gonna be doing transplants, you might plan out when it is that you plan to transplant. And then this is good because we all know that we might have the best intentions and it might be hailing that day. Um, and so we're not gonna actually do any transplanting on the date that we wanted to. So when is the date that you actually got that in the ground, right? Um, if it's a crop that you're direct sowing, right? So your beets or your beans perhaps, which dates um, would you plan on direct sowing? And then again, the date that you actually sowed, right? So coming down here, this is a place for you to take those numbers from the other table. Oh yeah, now this is the way this is made is so that it keeps this first columns um, locked. So you can move back and forth and you don't lose track of what it is you were looking at. Oh, um, all right. So the T and the DS, right? This is if you're gonna transplant it. This is if you're gonna direct sow it. And then these numbers, um, when you would actually start it indoor. Oh yeah, this is getting into, um, actually planning your transplants, right? How many successions, the section intervals, the type of flats that you're gonna use, the number of plants, um, all of that goes into this. I think I had it open further down the line. So these are the things you missed, right? Planning out when you're gonna start your, your transplants, uh, what type of flat you're going to use, how many plants you plan to grow, how many times you plan to do a succession and how often. All right, then we get into these one, these information. And then carrying over from the original tables, right? What was your planned feed of row? Uh, what was the plant spacing that you utilized? What was your row spacing? Um, based on your predictions, when did you estimate that you'd first be harvesting this? 
And this is really good work to do, especially if you set the date for your CSA. And on that date, your little customers are waiting there with open arms, hoping that they're going to get some food, right? So we've got to kind of go backwards from when we hope to deliver our first harvest and when do we need to get this in the ground so that we know we're getting it to them in time. Okay, so this would be your estimated first harvest date and then when did you actually get to harvest it. And then this would be a place where you could keep any notes about like, oh, this cultivar was terrible, everyone hated it, or you know, double this next year, all caps, right? So these are all things that I think are important to plan for and important to capture as the season progresses. But of course, your system is gonna be different. You might find that this is just way too much and, and you can't do this. Um, the other thing is if you are not the only farmer on your farm, if you have employees or you have other people that you're working with, um, this really helps to translate your vision and your message to anybody else who's gonna be doing the work so that they're not guessing, they're not asking you continually. You just say, refer to the production schedule, right? The production schedule has this stuff on it. All right, let's see if I can just close that. And again, it took me away from the PowerPoint. So I'm just gonna go back. This is fine. We can do this. Okay. So that is the sample production schedule. So here's something else. Uh, oh, let me just double check real quick. Any other questions you guys that I need to answer? I don't see anything right now. Okay, all right. So this was the next puzzle that I had, right? Was how much seed do I need to order? I can blow a lot of money on seed and then have it not be all used. And you know, our seed does lose viability from year to year. So I really don't wanna overbuy seed if I can help it. Um, ideally, we would only order the seed that we need for one season or even save the seed, right? If we're working on saving our seed. The other thing that I ran into is that there were so many ways that seed was sold. And when you started really trying to figure out how much you needed, um, there wasn't always a clear path to that. So I really felt that it was a puzzle. And so I created another workbook to help me wrap my mind around what, how much seed I needed for what I was trying to grow. Oh, and here was the other thing that drove me nuts, right? Is that some seed was sold in the, by the gram or the ounce or the pound right? And even still, some seed was sold, sold by the count, right? Some of those really fancy peppers or tomatoes, it's like five seeds. Like, okay, how, how, how do I figure this out? Uh, so I really wanted to, to be able to get to how much seed I needed um, so that I wasn't overspending or overbuying on the seed. So I developed this seed estimate workbook, and I'm going to share that with you so we can do a little bit of calculation right and play around with it a little bit so this is our yeah vegetable crop seed estimate so this helped a lot so this is where we would go back to the table that we had um, looked at worked on previously right about how many feet of row we needed to plant so let's just go let's just put in some numbers here so we determined let's say um and if somebody was better at Excel than I am, and maybe I could get somebody to do this for me to automatically generate this table based on the metrics in the first table. I think that's probably possible. So maybe I'll make that a task to work on. But for now, you would, you would finish the first table on planning your CSA, and then you would come and open up the seed estimate workshop and input these numbers um, and see where you got. So let's say that we determined that we needed 100 feet of arugula, um, we needed, let's say, 25 feet of basil. We needed, um, uh, let's say, 200 feet of beans, right? We're talking about maybe green beans. All right, you can see that these numbers are all changing here on the table. So what this is basically telling us is that we need 0 0.022 pounds of arugula seed to plant 100 feet of row. And this is just based on general, you know, down the line spacing, you know, probably six inches apart or something, you know, or maybe even smaller for arugula. Okay. Um, very, very small amount of seed for basil because we know how tiny and lightweight basil seed is. Uh, beans are a lot heavier. It's a much bigger seed. So it's about a half a pound of seed for a hundred foot of row. 
So now this tells us what we need. So for 200 feet of row of beans, we're gonna need 100 pounds of that seed. If we're buying the seed by the pound, we need about 0 0.02 pounds of, of basil, which is probably why most basil is not sold by the pound. It's probably grown, uh, sold by the ounce or the gram. Um, and then arugula, we would need two pounds to plant 100 feet of row. So a lot of different variations in here. In ounces, we would need about a third of an ounce of arugula, a lot less for the basil and about eight ounces of um, beans. And again, some of these are not ever sold in this way, so it's really not going to be um, a really reliable guide. You take this worksheet back to your seed catalog or to your seed buyer um, or to your scale if you're growing your own seed and figure this out, right? And so for a lot of seeds, like green bean seed is rarely sold by the gram, right? Because it'd be 226 grams, um, but often basil or arugula seed might be sold by the gram. And in that case, you're going to need almost 1,000 grams of arugula and 12 grams of basil. So hopefully this would help you. It doesn't help you a whole lot if the seed is sold by the, by the individual seed, um, but mostly you're not going to encounter that in a lot of our vegetable seed. And you can always go back to your row feed and see uh, how many plants are required per row feed, and then that would be the number of seed, individual seeds that you would need. And that's going to help you with planning your transplants too. Okay, so we can go down the list all the way, I, all, the, all the known quantities I have on here. But again, if you're growing something different or interesting, um, we can probably find those numbers. But this just does a lot of that for you um, so that you can come down to the end and get your totals of, of what you're going to need for each different crop. All right, so I think this might be the last time I have to switch back and forth. So thank you for... Um, bearing with me on that. Okay. And it looked like there was something in the chat. When I switch screens, I see it, but I don't when I'm presenting. We had a comment and it is, this is awesome. <laughs> Yay. Well, <laughs> give it a try. It might be a lot of stuff. Um, that, that's really great to hear. I was just it was really fun to develop these because I couldn't find them anywhere, especially for free. Um, and when you know when you're a graduate student, you're looking for free stuff. So wonderful. Um, so one other thing that we sent you today, and like this is not something that you would have to use our version, right? This is really easy for you to come up with on your own. Uh, but if you didn't want to, we really had this little. Um, we had these two sheets, and I still use these in our. Um, we have a community garden that we run a program out of. And I use this harvest chart. We still use it every week there. It's just a really quick way for you to jot down your harvest, right? Um, which vegetable, which cultivar, how many pounds or how many bunches, right? Because sometimes, um, and that can help you too to determine how many pounds of kale uh, equivalates or equi goes into how many bunches, right? You might be packing those differently. And then for your CSA record sheet, this is also really valuable to do. I really encourage you um, maybe even you just take a picture of it. I mean, just something so that you know what went into each share each week. So for example, which vegetable, which cultivar. Um, and we had, uh, we had two sizes of a CSA. We had a bushel, which is a family size. And then we had our peck size, which was either for an individual or maybe a couple that was busy and didn't eat a lot of vegetables. So that was how we had either the whole share or the half share. Um, and we didn't want people thinking they were only getting half of something, so we just gave it its own cute name. Um, but then we wrote how many how many bunches or pounds we put in the peck share and how many bunches or pounds we put into um, the bushel share. And this was really helpful later on when we tried to figure out, you know, were we giving people a, a fair deal? Were we giving them more than they paid for or less than they paid for? So you got all get these emailed to you. They're just a PDF. You can print them out and, and write on them. Um, if you really want them in a different format, I'm happy to send them, but this is probably something you can make for yourself too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about keeping records, right? I've talked about some records. I've shown you examples. Really, why is this so important? Okay, well, number one, if you keep those harvest records, you're gonna get a lot more accurate values of your expected yield than just using those commercially available predictions. Right. You'll be able to go back through and say, okay, we actually produce 60 pounds of this crop. 
with the given space, right? It just is, was not even close to what was nationally predicted as an average. So this will help you personalize your planning numbers a lot more and help you to dial it in even tighter um, because then you're gonna use those yield averages to adjust your own planning tools, right? So the recommended 100 feet of row didn't yield what you thought it or what it, it should on your farm. You've got different numbers so you can adjust accordingly. Um, and that's because some crops may vastly underperform or exceed these predicted values. Um, in our case, we found that cucumbers way overperformed, which was interesting because this is up in northern Idaho where we have a pretty short season and short cold day, our warm days and cold nights, but we had a bumper crop of cucumbers that year, whereas there were other crops that vastly underperformed. And so we would need to double or triple our planting in order to have enough to meet our customers' needs. Um, and then two, keeping track of what cultivars you plant. Um, really, there is so much difference between cultivars, either in the way that they yield, the way that they perform in different climatic and soil conditions. So it's really good to know which ones you're liking and which ones you say, never again, we're not gonna grow it. And just as soon as you find one that you really love, they're gonna discontinue it anyway. But it helps you to know which ones you liked. And then two, if you start to get into seed saving, you'll know which ones are really worth putting in the time and effort to preserve. So one thing that we did at the end of our season, and I really think this is a valuable exercise, um, at least a couple times per season, is just to take a random sample and track the value of your share. And I would like to do this ideally <clears throat> in the beginning of the season, uh, in the middle of the season when everything is just gangbusters and you've got tons of produce going into those boxes or bags, and then maybe towards the end of the season. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the overall value of that share to the customer. And are you charging them too much per week for what they're getting? Are you charging them too little, right? Or is it just right? And this is going to um, really help you to price your share and also adjust your numbers so that you're not overwhelming them or undercutting them. Um, and it also gives you a chance to see if you were selling this produce at farmer's market, right, and you were selling it by the piece, would you be making more money or less? And, you know, is the CSA really working for you financially? Um, oops, and I don't think I had the example of that. Um, but what we did is, I'm going to actually go back. Right, okay, so the CSA record sheet, right, this is where you would maybe take that for one week. And, um, you know, because we had a lot of more, well, we had some time on our hands. I don't know how you would want to do this, but we actually went to our local co-op, which was we thought was the most equivalent comparison to what they were getting, right? Um, we didn't compare it to Winco because we were actually certified organic and, um, and our stuff was really nice. We worked really hard on it and we didn't give anybody anything that was ugly. So this was really primo produce. So we took our CSA record sheet to the co-op and we priced out um, you know, what that bunch of kale would cost at the co-op, what that pint of cherry tomatoes would cost at the co-op. And we came up with a price list based on our share for that week. And, um, and then we compared that to what our per week sh um, share price was. So if they were paying $15 a week for our share price, and we took this to the co-op and we got $25, we were like, whoa, okay. So that seems like a lot. But because we had done it a few times during the season, we were able to show that in early spring, when they were getting a bunch of arugula, a bunch of kale, some green onions, and a little tiny pint of strawberries, and that was their whole share that week, um, that was not really you know, making that $15 a week. So it, you can see if it balances out across the season. And I think that's to be expected, right? Because the garden is lean in the early spring. Um, and so you might think about how you adjust it in order to make sure that they're getting at least close to that value every week. Um, all right, so that was just about a little bit about, um, about doing that and tracking the share value. I think Ariel, that was really valuable to us. Yes. We do have a question about pricing. Mindy asks, is there a good place to get organic vegetable pricing besides going to all the different grocery stores and writing it down? Ooh. You know, that's a really good question. There are some USDA um, uh, statistics that are put out pretty frequently um, that often discuss like the um, average price, but it's, it's harder for specialty crops to find 
like we weekly or monthly price fluctuations versus like commodity crops they re release a lot of information about commodity crop prices um you know but the other thing is that is that the prices don't change that much i mean you might tomatoes might be 219 a pound they might be 245 a pound they might go on sale for 199 a pound um but they don't change a whole lot so you could just do that once a season um, either at your farmer's market or um, or at your local market. Um, I'm trying to think, there probably are some other resources that can help you figure out that pricing, but I've always found that just going to the store and just doing a quick scan is the quickest way to do that and probably the most uh, reliable in terms of what your customers would be paying as an alternative versus USDA numbers may or may not have any impact on your local grocery, especially if you uh, live in a part of the state where um, you're a little more isolated, food has to travel a little bit further, food costs more, right? Food definitely costs more in different parts of the state and depending on um, the type of grocery or the type of farmer's market. So just something to think about. That's a great question. We have another question about value and this is yeah. from Erin. Erin asks, have you found veggie members value more in a CSA than in a grocery store? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, and that's a really good point when we think about pricing our share, right? Because we're not just selling them vegetables, right? If they go to the grocery store, they go to the co-op, they are, they're spending their own time. They're going there, they're picking it out, they're driving or walking or biking. Um, so we are offering them a service in that they don't have to shop. So that in, it, in itself is a value add. Um, Yes, I think we can certainly feel justified in pricing a bit be above market value for a CSA because you are adding value to it. And there is the value of the connection to the farmer, the connection to your farm, the traceability of, of that produce because they know exactly who grew it, where it was grown, how it was grown, right? In our, in our webinar on CSA from last year, we talk a little bit about communicating with your customers, surveying them, uh, getting feedback from them on, um, on what's working. And that, that is really something that you might wanna know from them. Do they find that they're, you know, they're getting a fair value for their CSA? But absolutely, it's more than just the price, the, the, the comparable price of the produce. So that's a great question. Um, so before I open it up to uh, just open for questions, um, I wanted to point out, we do have these two publications through our University of Idaho catalog. And for a number of years, I've been trying to finish the publication that incorporates all of these tables. And I, I think that this year is gonna be the year that that gets done. So um, consider that you all received an advanced copy, right? Of all the record keeping tools. And eventually we hope to have a guide that walks you through that. But these are the two that are currently in the catalog and available for free download online. So the one on the left is really just the things you consider um, when you wanna start a CSA. Is it a good fit for you and your farm? The second one, and Erin, maybe this is something that can help you too. This is really a, a publication that is designed for the consumer. So this is even something you could include in your shares the first week or email to your customers. It really just walks them through what is a CSA? Um, what are they supporting when they purchase it? What they can expect? Um, you know, some people have unrealistic expectations, right? They want tomatoes uh, in May. And unless you've got a high tunnel or a heated greenhouse, probably not gonna happen in Idaho. Uh, maybe, you, maybe if you have a hydroponic CSA, but I don't know anyone in Idaho doing that quite yet. Uh, but anyway, so it just walks them through some of those common questions and really explains what goes into a CSA. Um, so that I think, Oh, and then I just wanted to say that occasionally, every couple of years, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture puts out a CSA directory. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how they get this information. I think they might look on local harvest. Uh, they might survey growers. Certainly, if they're Idaho preferred members, then they have that information about them. So if you would like your CSA to be listed in this, you can contact the marketing staff at Idaho State Department of Agriculture and let them know you'd like to be included on this list. I don't feel like it's in any way a comprehensive list of the CSAs. And again, because I don't, I don't think it's easily trackable. All right, so just some, some cute students harvesting for a CSA. We have learned and come a lot really far since that time. Um, 
All right. So I would like to open it up for, oh, I just wanted to go back and say, it's just amazing that we could grow all of this on the Palouse. This was, I think, our final share of the season. We really packed it full of everything that we had left and uh, and gave everybody, you know, a really big share. So, oh, I just love looking at that food. I am so hungry for local food now. Here is it at the end of January. All right, so we've got about five minutes for any other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask. We. We don't have any questions that have come in yet, Ariel, but we'll give it a second. And why that's coming up, oh, we do have a question just popped in. Have you come across ideas for combinations of fresh vegetables that go well together and give CSA members multiple options for consuming them? Ooh, that is a great question. So I know that we would give, we would give recipes in our CSA newsletter every week or tuck them into the shares. And we would try to take into consideration what was in that box. If there were onions and, you know, and beans, we would maybe come up with a recipe that had both. But to actually plan your CSA that way is really a cool idea. I mean, that would really be a culinary CSA, I think. Um, it would probably be a little bit next level in terms of planning. But certainly, you know, or even if you can wait a week to harvest something that doesn't go with anything else in the box, you could certainly do it that way. I love that idea. Um, oh, I can see the questions now, Colette. Should I just read them? Sure. Okay, so uh, the next one was, how big was our garden and how many members did it serve? That's great. So up at our campus farm, we had three acres um, that were part of the student farm, um, but we actually only had a quarter acre directly in production and we did serve a 35 member CSA. So we were, we were feeding about 65 individuals. So our planning numbers would have been for 65 and then we packaged up about 35 shares. So um, you can get a lot of food um, out of a small space, really, if you're, if you're thoughtful about your planting. Um, oh, and another great question that I have a great answer for. Uh, so can you recommend a class for a new grow, Idaho grower for planning? I have a greenhouse and a hoop house. Well, we have a cultivating success course that is starting in February called Planning the Market Garden, Planning and Production for Market Garden. So I would really recommend you check out that class. It's um, listed on our Cultivating Success website. And I think that would be a wonderful way to start. Um, and then you might also check with Extension in your county and see if there's anything um, additional being offered. So great question. Got a couple more minutes. If you've got anything else that you want to know, also, I believe, Mackenzie, do they have my email address? They should, but I can put it in the chat and then in our follow-up emails as well. Okay. Yeah, so if you start to work through those tables, if you have any questions, I would especially love feedback, you know, as to how this could work a little bit better or if I've missed something that you really want to have included. Because like I said, as we get these closer to being ready for publication, I, I uh, feel even better about having your input. So really appreciate it. Thank you, Ariel, for that amazing presentation and sharing those resources. Those spreadsheets are absolutely fabulous and are gonna be really helpful. I wanted to let everyone know that tomorrow you will get an email that has a link to a post webinar survey. And one of the questions on the survey is going to be, what else did you want to learn about CSAs? And that will be really helpful if you could provide that feedback. The survey will only take about three minutes. You will also get a handout of today's slides. So you'll have the PowerPoint presentation. Again, you were emailed all of the Excel forms and the resources that Ariel showed you earlier. You'll also get a link to the webinar recording. So if you logged in a little bit late or you want to be able to go back and rewatch, you'll be able to do that. Um, if you visit cultivatingsuccess.org and you click on Idaho, you are going to be able to see our upcoming programs. And there's quite a diversity of programs that are coming up this year. So our webinars are a little bit different this year in that we have themed every month. So this month, we're talking about planning for your markets and reaching your customers. We actually have two webinars coming up next week. Generally speaking, our webinars are on Tuesday, but we just had to fit in this excellent webinar on season extension in Idaho. 
So next Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Mountain, you can sign up for season extension in Idaho. And then on Tuesday, we have Emily Black, who's with Lone Mountain Farms in North Idaho. She is a marketing expert. That has been her career. And now she is doing a lot of work in terms of helping customers or helping farmers reach their customers online. So she will be our guest talking about four strategies to reach your customers online, which is obviously super important to be able to have that online presence. So we do encourage you to visit cultivatingsuccess.org forward slash webinar dash series and sign up for future webinars. We also wanted to let you know that we have the recorded webinars that Ariel talked about on our website as well. So you can search those by topic. And in addition to having one looking overall at starting a CSA, we do have some webinars that are recorded about safe operating during COVID-19. So if you miss those, there's some great webinars, not only about farm deliveries or pickup, but also looking at being at farmer's market. So we encourage you to check those out as well as our COVID-19 resources page. With that, thank you for joining us today. We do hope that we see you on an upcoming webinar. And thank you again, Ariel. Thank you. Have a great week.